den Pendelleiter in dieser Art kurz vorzutragen. Dankeschön. Zehn Minuten, die optimal zu zweit. Ja, bitte. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, versteht man mich? Funktioniert das Mikrofon? Sehr gut. Äh, wie gesagt, meine Aufgabe war es, das Pendel internationale Organisationen zu leiten. Ein hochspannendes Pendel. Wir haben insgesamt sechs Beiträge gehabt, äh, von der UNO angefangen über ICC, sprich Strafgerichtshof, äh, über Europäische Union, NATO bis äh, Lobbyismus und, und SCO natürlich, die Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Und wir hatten für jeden Vortrag ca. 10 Minuten Zeit. Die Zeit wurde überschritten, weil es einfach spannend war, weil es komplexe Thematiken sind. Und vor allem, es geht um die umfassende Sicherheit, die wir in Österreich auch so bezeichnen, beziehungsweise, wie es international heißt, um den Comprehensive Approach. Die Organisationen, wie gesagt, es gibt ein schönes Wienerlied, wenn der Herrgott nicht will, nutzt das gar nichts. Wenn die P5 nicht wollen, wenn sie zerstritten sind, wenn sie unwillig sind, sich in wesentlichen Fragen zu einigen. Ähnliches gilt natürlich für die supranationale Gemeinschaft Europäische Union. Wir haben gesagt, es ist nicht die Kommission, die Gesetze macht, es sind die Mitgliedstaaten, die Gesetze machen. Es liegt am Wohl der Mitgliedstaaten, die Europäische Union weiterzuentwickeln, ähnlich bei den Vereinten Nationen. Ähnlich natürlich bei der NATO. Äh, bei der NATO ist es interessant, es wird kein Mitgliedstaat deswegen von der NATO hinausgedrängt, weil es die 2 pflicht nicht erfüllt. Es ist ein, eine, politische Linie, eine politische Richtlinie sozusagen, nichts Legales, aber eine, eine, eine Richtlinie, die es zu erfüllen gibt, ist aber die Frage, wie dann die 2 überhaupt aussehen. 2 für Portugal sind etwas anderes wie 2 für die USA oder 2% für die Tschechische Republik oder Dänemark. Also das gilt es auch in diesen Ländern weiterhin zu eruieren. Der strategische Handlungswille ist nur bedingt da in Bezug der Europäischen Union natürlich eine sehr marginale Außenpolitik, natürlich in der Iran-Frage. Wir werden jetzt wahrscheinlich den, zum Teil den US-Kurs übernehmen. Also der Iran hat ja laut eigenen Angaben in Teheran heute damit begonnen, wieder äh, Uran anzureichen und zwar über das Normalmaß hinaus. Das heißt, würde einen, offenlich, einen Bruch des äh, Atomabkommens darstellen und die Europäische Union hat natürlich angekündigt, hier natürlich dann Sanktionen gemeinsam mit den USA zu erlassen. Und natürlich ist das dann Sache wieder der UNO, Internationale Atomenergiebehörde, äh, hier tätig zu werden. Des Weiteren, wie gesagt, die Strafgerichtsbarkeit, hochinteressantes Thema, der Öffentlichkeit weniger beleuchtetes Thema, Internationaler Strafgerichtshof gibt es einen strategischen Willen. Also Frau Magister Falkner von der Uni Innsbruck hat betont natürlich den Afrika-Fokus des ISDGH. Also interessant, äh, natürlich ein Beispiel natürlich mit Omar al-Bashir, den ehemaligen sudanesischen Präsidenten, wobei Sudan hier nicht Mitglied ist, dieser, dieses Gerichtshof. Aber es ist, ist wahrscheinlich der Grund, warum er auch von China nicht eingesperrt worden ist, beziehungsweise, wie gesagt, es haben mehrere Länder, wie gesagt, da waren ja über... 100 Staatsbesuche von Omar al-Bashir und er wurde nicht nirgendwo verhaftet. Also das heißt, es liegt an den Mitgliedstaaten, wenn diese wollen, passiert etwas, wenn sie nicht wollen, passiert eben wenig. Wenn es Uneinigkeit gibt, wie gesagt, das fängt bei kleineren Staaten, Staatengruppierungen wie bei der Europäischen Union, bis zu den Vereinten Nationen, hier Mittel, Sanktionen zu machen. Wir sind jetzt auch bei den Russland-Sanktionen. Wie gesagt, es sind nicht alle Länder begeistert über Russland-Sanktionen. Die Unternehmerschaft sagt ganz oft, was ist der Sinn der Sanktionen. Und es, es, es sind natürlich gewisse Dinge, die auch innerhalb der UNO, wie gesagt, da kann die UNO an sich nichts dafür, das sind nur die Mitgliedstaaten, die hier nicht übereinkommen. Natürlich Lobbying, es ist immer so, wir kennen das von der NATO, das wurde heute auch in der in der, in der, beim Pendel auch das Wort Party genannt, also wenn in Afghanistan eine Party stattfindet, in dem Fall ISAF oder RSM, da müssen wir hin, weil es die anderen auch so machen. Es ist auch interessant, äh, ich kenne es zum Teil von der Europäischen Union, wo es heißt, wenn Deutschland und Frankreich übereinkommen, müssen dann alle anderen widerspruchslos das hinnehmen, wenn man gewisse Sitzungen 
verfolgt und in der Europäischen Union, wo man Kollegen kennt von diversen Arbeitssitzungen, von den Räten, von den zehn Ministerräten, ist interessant, gerade im Wirtschaftsbereich, da heißt dann immer, was Deutschland, was Deutschland und Frankreich will und die anderen schweigen fast. Wie gesagt, das ist aber nicht Schuld von Deutschland und Frankreich, das ist Schuld der anderen Länder, wenn sie nichts mit dem hinzuzufügen haben. Also es ist immer Lobbyismus heißt oder überhaupt Politik gestalten heißt, sich selbst äh, einzubringen. Und wie gesagt, die Idee des Weltstrafgerichtshofes ist eine gute, das war natürlich dann äh, ab 1998 äh, wirksam mit den römischen Statuten. Nur ist die Frage, wer richtet über wen? Vor kurzem wurde ja die Chefanklägerin Ben Suda wurde das Einreisevisum in die USA äh, stillgelegt, also sie durfte nicht einreisen. Also es gibt natürlich Vorbehalte gegenüber den Mächten, die letzten Endes so maßgeblich sind für die Gestaltung der internationalen Ordnung, USA, China, Russland und wo man sagt, in einem gewissen Bereich auch Indien, aber wir, wir sind nicht Teil des internationalen Strafgerichtshofes. Es gibt Andeutungen oder Experten, die meinen, auch in, in der Europäischen Union gäbe es Ungereimtheiten, die den internationalen Strafgerichtshof interessieren könnten. Es ist natürlich dann die Frage, wie Europa oder die Europäische Union oder Mittelstaaten reagieren, wenn, äh, ja, wenn, der, wenn der internationale Strafgerichtshof der Meinung ist, diverse Länder der Europäischen Union oder die Europäische Union selbst äh, an die Anklagebank zu führen. Also diese Erfahrung wäre natürlich für die EU bzw. einzelne Mitgliedstaaten neu. Also kurz gesagt, die, jede Organisation wie jeder Verein ist so stark, wie es die Mitglieder wollen. Äh, wir kennen es im kleinen Bereich von den Europäischen Unionspräsidentschaften, für gewisse Länder war es gewisse, gewisse Ratsvorsitze, war es gewisser weniger Erfolg, für gewisse Ratsvorsitze war gewisser mehr Erfolg. Äh, wir in Österreich sind eher pragmatischer rangegangen, schauen wir mal, was wird. Äh, zum Teil ist es ein Erfolg geworden, zum Teil natürlich weniger Erfolg, äh, aber das liegt natürlich auch an der Zusammenarbeit oder am Verhandlungsgeschick oder je nachdem an den politischen Herausforderungen der jeweiligen Zeit, ähnlich natürlich bei der UNO und bei der NATO. Bei der NATO wurde auch betont vom Dozenten Dr. Mantovani aus der Schweiz, dass beim nächsten strategischen Konzept, also das, wir haben nach wie vor das strategische Konzept aus dem Jahr 2010, heißt ebenfalls das strategische Konzept von Lissabon, der NATO. Und das nächste Konzept wird nächstes Jahr beschlossen. Es ist die Frage, was dann dabei herauskommt, wie viele Ambitionen die Mitgliedstaaten dann tatsächlich imstande sind, umzusetzen. Äh, natürlich beim Kopfnicken, bei Gesprächen sind sich alle einig, nach dem Motto, da muss was passieren. Aber wenn natürlich ein gewisser Druck aus den USA nicht da ist, ich spreche jetzt aber nicht speziell vom US-Präsidenten Donald Trump, sondern schon die USA macht diesbezüglich seit ungefähr den 1950er Jahren Druck, dass die Europäer doch etwas mehr für ihre Verteidigung tun sollen. Also dass Verteidigung kein Freizeitvergnügen ist, wissen wir. Zum Teil haben wir, haben wir es mit, in Europa mit Wohlstandsgesellschaften zu tun, die oft nicht da erkennen, was dann die wahren Bedrohungen sind, wo manche dann glauben, naja, gewisse Probleme erledigen sich von selbst, wie die sogenannte Migrationsfrage, dass man sich da eher weniger darum kümmert und eher mit Abschottungstendenzen reagiert, als wie tatsächlich mit einer gewissen Vorneverteidigung wo ich habe heute gesagt, in Afrika liegt unsere Zukunft, Afrika den Kontinent gemeinsam aufbauen. Es gibt Länder, die sich sehr gut entwickeln mittlerweile. Es gibt auch junge Unternehmer, die Startups gegründet haben, die mit Europa, mit Amerika, äh, natürlich auch mit China weiter Folge äh, kooperieren möchten, wo Technologie auch mittlerweile auch im kleinen Bereich entsteht. Und wie gesagt, Afrika ist der reichste Kontinent der Welt, wenn man das von Bodenschätzen betrifft. Aber es bedarf auch in Bezug auf sehr langfristige Perspektiven, auch langfristiger Arbeitsmarktpolitiken, Wirtschaftspolitiken, Bildungspolitiken in diesen Ländern. Also das heißt, Stützung des Sicherheitsapparates, da brauchen wir UNO, NATO, da brauchen wir die Europäische Union und vor allem die wirtschaftliche Perspektive ist sehr wichtig. Und da können internationale Organisationen natürlich mit den maßgeblichen Mitgliedstaaten und auch kleinere Mitgliedstaaten einiges bewirken. Nur... Das braucht Zeit. Das kann nicht in zwei Wochen entstehen, das kann nicht in zehn Jahren entstehen. Es braucht Zeit. Wie gesagt, das ist ein langfristiger Approach, der sicher für die nächsten Jahrzehnte, wenn nicht für das nächste Jahrhundert hinein, zu gestalten ist. Dankeschön.
Ja, zunächst möchte ich mich einmal bei den Dolmetschern bedanken. Unser Pendel Strategische Kommunikation, Strategie und Medien war ja zweisprachig besetzt. Ähm, ja, wir haben folgenden Ausgangspunkt gehabt. Es klingt ja eigentlich sehr einfach. Zuerst gibt es einmal einen Willen, dann kommt eine Strategie und dann sucht man sich einen Weg, versucht man Mittel zu finden, Kanäle, dass man seine Strategie auch umsetzt, so dass die verschiedenen Botschaften beim Gegenüber ankommen und dass man sein strategisches Ziel erreicht. Klingt ganz einfach. Ja? Nur jeder versteht etwas anderes unter strategischer Kommunikation. Dann haben wir eine Vielfalt von Definitionen, der Begriffe Kommunikation, Strategie und wie alle anderen Bereiche mit hineinspielen. Und es gibt schon zahlreiche Beratungsfirmen heutzutage, die mit diesen Dingen spielen und Strategy und Corporate Identity und Kommunikation. Und auch das Wort Strategie selbst hat schon einen eigenen Wert, weil irgendeine Tätigkeit bekommt einen höheren Wert, sobald man sie mit dem Wörtchen Strategie oder strategisch dann versieht. Das war so ein bisschen der Ausgangspunkt. Und dann äh, haben wir uns auch angesehen, äh, wie weit das Ganze zurückreicht. Eigentlich äh, ist die Menschheit schon seit Jahrtausenden mit dieser Thematik befasst. Es finden sich immer andere Wege, wie man mit dieser Thematik umgeht, aber die Menschheit hat sich schon immer damit befasst und wir haben heute äh, ausgehend von Clausewitz ein bisschen die Geschichte beleuchtet, das hat konkret Oberstleutnant Ude nachher dann gemacht, von Clausewitz ausgehend, wie dann die Öffentlichkeitsarbeit mit der Strategie ähm, verbunden wird. Dann haben wir in einem weiteren Vortrag äh, vom Herrn Oberst, der sitzt da in der dritten Reihe, ähm, hat die ganze Strategie im gesamtstaatlichen äh, Kontext betrachtet, die Strategieentwicklung und hat ein sehr prägnantes Bild gebracht von einem Adventkalender. Wenn man einen Adventkalender hat, der ein Hintergrundbild kriegt, aber viele Leute immer nur ein Türchen aufmachen und dann ein Stück Schokolade draus bekommen, aber das Gesamtbild dahinter nicht sehen. Ja. Ähm, wir haben da verschiedene Aspekte beleuchtet, dann sind wir äh, zum äh, Aspekt der Bundeswehr gekommen, wenn es um die Social Media geht. Wie versucht man die Strategie der Bundeswehr über die Social Media zu transportieren? Daraus ist später dann in der Publikumsrunde, sage ich mal, ähm, die Diskussion entstanden, wer ist dann wirklich die Zielgruppe? Und wenn wir Bilder zeigen von irgendwelchen Geräten, entspricht das dann tatsächlich auch immer der Realität? Und, und wo ist dann die Grenze? Wie macht man das? Und dann spielt wieder ein bisschen Werbung mit hinein. Also ein sehr großer Themenkomplex. Und ähm, dann hat äh, Commander Kottner noch ein, ein Fallbeispiel aus Großbritannien gebracht, jetzt aktuell äh, unter dem Thema Brexit, wie da die Strategie aussieht und verschiedene Möglichkeiten dazu. Ja, also unterm Strich waren sich alle einig, dass man dieses Thema Wochen, Monate diskutieren kann. Das heißt, das Thema geht sowieso noch weiter, so wie die Menschheit das ja schon seit Jahrtausenden äh, diskutiert. Im Prinzip ist das ja auch das Spannende dann daran, dass man nicht einfach nur ein Schema F hat und nachdem geht es nachher dann die ganzen Jahrhunderte hindurch so weiter. Das heißt, für die nächste Konferenz gibt es sicher einige Themenaspekte in diesem Bereich, die man noch diskutieren muss. Das war es von meiner Seite. Meine sehr geehrten Bandleiter, bleibt mir nur mehr über, mich noch einmal recht herzlich zu bedanken. Die Synergie hat wunderbar stattgefunden. Ich glaube, das äh, Auditorium ist jetzt in der Lage, beide Dinge zu verknüpfen. Äh, und wenn du oder Magister Axmann äh, für ein Gespräch, für Fragen noch auch telefonisch erreichbar wäre, könnten wir das so machen. Dankeschön. <lacht> Ladies and Gentlemen, uh, Professor Jamie Shee has such an impact on us that we decided to make you acquainted with that impact only in small portions. So we gave you first an appetizer when Professor Shee was on the panel of the practitioners, and now you will be confronted with the full thrust, depth, and excellence of your speech. Sir, the floor is yours. Well, th th thank you very much. Uh, 
if they pay for your airfare, they really do expect uh, to be repaid in blood uh, and flesh. Uh, that is clear. Um, when I'm asked to do uh, two presentations uh, on the same day, I always am torn between conflicting emotions. On the one hand, there's a sense that I must have been so brilliant in the first session that everybody's expecting an equally brilliant performance, or I was so terrible uh, that you have sort of taken pity on me and given me a chance, you know, to make, as the French say, amende honorable. Uh, I don't know what it is. I'll leave that for you to judge. But in, in any case, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, I'm still very impressed uh, to see at this uh, late stage uh, of the conference there are still more people in the audience than on the stage. Uh, I have experienced the opposite situation uh, a few times in my NATO career. Uh, but anyway, thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you on what strategy means today. Um, strategy is an overblown word. We love it. It sounds good. You know, to call anything strategic is to sort of elevate it to a plane of incomprehensible generality. Uh, but uh, let's face it, uh, we are, are very bad at predicting uh, events. If a few years ago uh, I would have said to you that we would have had the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Brexit vote, uh, the attacks on the World Trade Center, uh, virtually everything that has happened uh, has not been uh, uh, predicted, um, you would have probably sort of sent me for psychiatric treatment. Uh, we are not very good at anticipating the future, and, uh, and to some degree, the role of strategy is to reflect a certain degree of modesty about uh, policymakers. Uh, strategy is basically exploiting things when they go in your favor, you know, like surfing. If you have a good wave, then, you know, stay up there uh, and try to take it as far as you possibly can while you can. If you're on the defensive, as we are at the moment, strategy is all about consolidating your position, you know, limiting the damage, limiting your losses, being in a position to sort of bounce back uh, on a uh, future uh, occasion. In other words, strategy is about the management of complexity. In the 90s, uh, which was the golden age of my career at NATO, we were on the strategic offensive in a good sense. You know, the Berlin Wall came down. We were able to enlarge NATO, which would have been unthinkable a few years earlier without provoking a war with Russia. We were even able to engage Russia uh, uh, at one particular time. I remember very well visiting Bosnia, visiting Kosovo, and spending the day with the Russians who were participating in the NATO-led uh, peacekeeping mission. It, it seemed like a surreal age uh, in comparison to what we have today, but it was only 20 years ago, uh, a flash uh, in uh, historical uh, terms. We were able to intervene in the Balkans, as I was saying this morning, and establish uh, certain principles which uh, at least looked realistic at the time in terms of humanitarian intervention, the responsibility to protect, the comprehensive approach was mentioned, the first time when the international organizations came together to share their competencies to rebuild uh, failed states and, uh, and failing countries uh, as well. Uh, we were able to launch the idea of a European defense component, which again would have seemed unrealistic just a few years uh, be before then. Um, but now, of course, it's different. We are on the strategic defensive. The world is becoming more complex, so the aim of strategy is to try to manage complexity uh, uh, and place as much order on it as we uh, possibly can. But we have to be modest uh, because we're up against sort of five uh, big strategic shifts uh, which are not going to dissipate uh, any time soon. Uh, the first one, and again, I can be fast because we discussed this this morning, as I've said, is that we are tending to generate more adversaries than friends or partners. Uh, and when you are generating more adversaries than you are building friends and partnerships, then you know that you're going to be in, 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 in trouble. So strategy now has to be focused, to says you, uh, on a number of different rivals without knowing which ones you might end up fighting, which ones you might end up uh, containing. And of course, if you choose the wrong adversary for a strategy of containment, you may be badly equipped for the adversary that comes out of the blue and that you may end up having to fight one day. And don't forget that uh, dealing with those adversaries is painful and long. I mean, let's take ISIS. ISIS at its height managed to generate uh, about 40,000 fighters. 
Well, for a terrorist organisation, that's big, but for a nation state, it, it's tiny. It generated about $6 million of income a month, and it had a caliphate which was slightly larger than Belgium and the Netherlands. Not what you would consider to be a major adversary, yet it took four years. It took four years. It took the deployment of thousands of Western troops. It took a sustained air campaign. It took the, the almost total destruction of five or six cities. Uh, have you seen pictures, for example, uh, uh, today of uh, Raqqa in, in Syria, for example, or places like Ramadi uh, in Iraq? Uh, it reminds me of Vietnam when we had to destroy the village in order to save it. Um, a price tag of reconstruction, which is run, running into the hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, modest uh, sums, uh, in order to defeat the caliphate. And even having succeeded there, nobody in their right mind would think that ISIS has gone away, in fact. Uh, Iraq, has re Iraq has reported about 200 uh, ISIS-inspired terrorist attacks since the fall of Rafa, Iraq excuse me, alone. So if that is what it takes to defeat even a minor adversary, think what it would be like if ever we were engaged in a conflict with a major peer uh, adversary. Uh, and, of course, we, along the way, while dealing with these more long-term uh, uh, potential uh, adversaries or real adversaries have to deal with the adversaries that come and go, like Somali pirates, for example, that kept us busy, uh, costing 12 uh, billion, a mil a billion euros a year in terms of funding uh, for the uh, operations in the Gulf of Aden at the height of that particular uh, uh, problem. The second uh, big uh, change, uh, and again we referred to this briefly this morning, is mo mo multiple overlapping uh, loyalties. Uh, is the UK in Europe or not in Europe any longer post-Brexit? Uh, we don't really know. It's in Europe uh, militarily speaking, but it's no long, longer going to be so prominent in Europe economically. How is this going to play out? Is, uh, and Dan referred to this when he questioned me, is the acquisition by Turkey of S-400 uh, Russian air defense missiles a sign that Turkey is leaving the West or, 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 or not? Is the fact that Germany is funding uh, Rus the Russian economy to the tune of billions of euros a year uh, by purchases of Russian gas through Nord Stream? What does that say? Or Hungary is building Russian finance nuclear power stations, or Italy is the first country of the G7 uh, to join China's Belt and Road Initiative. But it's in good company because 16, 16 EU countries now participate in the annual uh, uh, East European China Summit, last one in Dubrovnik, and have also signed up to the Belt uh, and Road uh, Initiative. And what does this therefore mean for where countries' first loyalties will lie in any strategic confrontation in the future when they have so many particular levers of influence over their uh, decision-making uh, as, as well? That is perhaps an aspect of globalization that we've been late in waking uh, uh, up to. Uh, we have multiple fronts. I've said this before, it no longer, you, strategy no longer has the luxury of dealing with one particular problem in, in one space. It's about handling a range of different problems and difficult decisions about the allocation of resources to each of those particular fronts. It, it's like, uh, gentlemen, when you put on your swimming trunks, uh, you can only cover a certain percentage of your body with your swimming trunks, and you have to make a strategic decision on which part of the body you choose to place uh, the uh, trunk. So you can't cover uh, everything. Uh, multiple fronts also mean that we are now in an age where anybody can attack anything at any time, anywhere. Distance doesn't matter. A 16-year-old kid in Bradford in the United Kingdom uh, came home from school every evening, went up to his bedroom, uh, his parents never knew what he was up to, and he was in his bedroom on his computer, and without leaving his bedroom, in total isolation, he managed to organise a terrorist cell in Melbourne, Australia. He procured the financing, he procured the explosives, he did all of the organisation, and had this terrorist cell plan to attack the Anzac uh, military parade in Melbourne, which was uh, thwarted in the nick of time, but it shows that what one kid can do uh, simply uh, with uh, uh, the internet uh, and technology. And, and this means that for the first time in history, governments have the responsibility of defending everything. Potentially, everything is a target, the transport systems, ports, airfields, container ships. Uh, one individual a couple of days, a couple of months back uh, in my country uh, managed to paralyze Gatwick Airport for two days uh, by flying uh, a 
very uh, cheap commercial drone across the runway at Gatwick Airport, uh, which led to complete traffic chaos. Uh, and one particular airline, in terms of compensation, was forced to pay out £26 million, pounds, uh, a massive uh, loss uh, for that particular incident. So everything is potentially vulnerable uh, with a big impact for a very minor input. Never before, economically speaking, has the ratio between a tiny investment and a massive strategic impact uh, be some, uh, become so great. And and undermined our lack of preparedness and resilience for those kind of uh, scenarios. Uh, and so uh, when everything becomes potentially a target and targets are constantly shifting, governments have very difficult choices to make about where they put the priority at any one time. Risk assessment, risk management, you know, how do I calculate risk? Uh, we're all speaking to Zurich Re, Swiss Re, uh, Munich Re and all of the big insurance agencies at the moment to try to understand, guys, how do you quantify and assess risk? And can you give us your risk maturity model so that we can get a better idea about how cost effective our investments uh, can possibly uh, uh, be? Uh, multiple fronts, as I mentioned this morning, also generate particular problems uh, when it comes to solidarity, as countries expect as a quid pro quo for their engagement in somebody else's strategic front, a similar effort where they feel that they are alone or abandoned uh, and on the front line. And dealing with three sort of, you know, trying to play in three tennis matches at once while other people are hitting balls against you, believe, me on, believe it or not, is not easy in terms of uh, focus, particularly for governments that have a habit strategically of only being able to handle one crisis at one time. Henry Kissinger famously used to joke, there can't be a crisis this week, my diary is already full. Uh, but, of course, in the real world, we, we can't uh, say that. Uh, and we have to have the strategic bandwidth to be able to handle multiple issues at uh, any uh, particular one time, particularly as the focus of strategy shifts uh, from borders and land uh, towards uh, the control of the mindset, the belief system, the definition of truth that our populations hold, uh, their political loyalties towards a state, towards an ethnic group, towards a cultural or an identity uh, sense of belonging uh, within the uh, state as well when they are exposed to so many different uh, influences also over which we have uh, no control. Is our security still really at borders? Is it still tied up with land? Or, or is it more with doing what we can to prevent the polarization in our societies, which our adversaries uh, are so well able to uh, exploit? It's all very well, ladies and gentlemen, talking about Russia uh, uh, and its uh, disinformation fake news campaigns, for example, trying to influence the poll in Brexit in, in my country, the UK. But let me tell you, it was 40 years of traditional media in the UK uh, uh, talking nonsense about the European Union and blacking its image. That was responsible for Brexit far more than any attempt by Russia, not that I'm trying to let Russia off the hook, to interfere uh, through its own uh, belated fake news uh, uh, campaign. So our own worst enemy has become ourselves. Uh, our adversaries don't need to do very much uh, anymore uh, to us. Um, it's almost as if they have sticks at the river who just have to sort of prop the ship every now and again just to send it on the course towards the rapids. But the ship is built by us and is being piloted and steered by our uh, uh, selves. So in other words, uh, warfare is now uh, the ability uh, to, ex to create and then have exploited your own intrinsic uh, weaknesses. Uh, and, uh, of course, that's good to the extent that the answer lies with us rather than the defeat of foreign powers, but it's bad because we are, find it much easier to cope with the weaknesses of adversaries than to pinpoint and act on the weaknesses of ourselves. The next big shift is contested domain. So when I was uh, uh, entering NATO back in the 80s, life was easy because there were only three domains, land, sea and air, uh, which were more or less in our ge geographical reason, uh, region. Um, only one big adversary, uh, as I uh, said uh, at the time, and the geographical demarcation lines were respected. You know, the, the Romans used to talk about the Mediterranean as Mare Nostrum, our sea. It's ours. You know, your, your, your geographical zone is there. This is ours. You know, we own it. Only our ships sail there. You know, all of the ports are controlled and owned by uh, uh, us. You know, we have mastery of our own internal lines of communication. 
uh, the Atlantic in my country is referred to as the pond, as if it doesn't really exist between the United States and uh, the United uh, Kingdom. That's gone. Uh, one of the great uh, uh, indicators of cur the current world is that everybody interferes in everybody else's business. Uh, as Lenin would have put it, Dan liked to quote Lenin, what's mine is mine, but what's yours is negotiable permanently. Um, China sells in the Baltic, uh, uh, for, for example. Uh, uh, now also in the Eastern Mediterranean. Iran sells in the Eastern Mediterranean. I don't, don't even need to speak about Russian activity uh, in the high north, in the Atlantic, in the Mediterranean as well. Um, we uh, now have to share everything, our cyberspace, our airspace, maybe tomorrow our land space, certainly our sea space, certainly space space. Uh, where China and Russia have pushed a large degree of militarization of space, even now maneuvering Russian satellites close to, for example, a French satellite uh, just last year, interfering, jamming our GPS signals in, in space, uh, testing lasers, uh, interfering with um, uh, all of our electronic communications at a time when NATO is dependent for 70% of its communications on space, getting inside our cyber and our data networks, getting inside our media space as, 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 as well. So all spaces are uh, contested. And a strategist these days has to be prepared to fight, not only in the land, sea and air domain, but also has to be prepared to fight in cyberspace has to be now prepared to fight in space space. Uh, for example, if you take the, Gulf, the last Gulf War, and this was already 15 years ago, back in 2003, 68% of all American bombs were guided through satellite transmission in space. And that was 15 years ago. So imagine what that figure uh, would be like uh, today. And therefore, strategy is deciding, well, which one am I going to fight in? Which one's important? Which one can I win in? If I win in space space, do I win in all of the others? You know, how can I be the best guy, not at being superior in each domain, but at connecting the domains? This is the crucial thing at the moment. So a space signal can fire a missile from an F-35 against a ship, for example, in the Pacific. How do I do that integration of the various domains to achieve the synergy that plays in my favour against an opponent who may have good individual assets but doesn't do the integration of the domains like I do? This is really going to be the big future of, of uh, uh, military planning uh, as we go uh, forward. Um, this world, of course, uh, means uh, constant friction, uh, almost daily uh, crises. Uh, and is going to put a premium on us uh, to manage those crises successfully in a way that we haven't really had to do since the Cuban Missile Crisis or some of the other crises uh, of the uh, uh, Cold uh, War, uh, to prevent miscalculation, to prevent misunderstanding, to be good at signalling, uh, to deploy our troops neither too early or too late in order to uh, reinforce deterrence, to have a clear idea about what the threshold is of aggression. When do we declare that... Enough is enough. Uh, how do we make sure that our reactions over time build up a new pattern of deterrence? Not through saying, I have a nuclear weapon and therefore deterrence is assured, but I have a pattern of behavior. Uh, what Paul Nakasone, the, if you know him, the uh, head of the American Cyber Command, calls a, a, a persistent approach uh, whereby... or. Uh, persistent engagement whereby over, by establishing a consistent pattern of reaction over time we gradually condition our adversary to see something which at the moment he sees as high gain and low risk as the opposite uh, potentially high risk um, in terms of the punishment the retaliation and increasingly uh, low gain as as well finally uh, the collapse of norms. I mean, yesterday uh, the NATO defence ministers met in Brussels. You've seen the main headlines. It was the Secretary General saying, well, you know, Russia's got until the 2nd of August to bring itself into compliance with the INF Treaty. But do I really think that's going to happen? No. You do. Russia isn't. In fact, Russia has now introduced legislation to withdraw from the INF Treaty. And so the Secretary General said, we now have to prepare for the post-INF world. And the discussion was about countermeasures. You know, what do we do now that Russia has once again deployed land-based intermediate-range missiles, the SSC-8, uh, against European targets? It reminds me of the SS-20 crisis 
which was there when I first joined NATO um, in 1980. You, do we look at sea-based systems, air-based systems, B-52s, F-16s, uh, if we rule out land-based deployments, upgrading missile defense, which now does become much more directed vis-a-vis -vis Russia than Iran, for example, uh, what? But, you know, we didn't have to think about that uh, for, uh, since 1987 because the treaty took care of the problem by eliminating the entire category of either conventional or nuclear land-based systems. But that political restraint has gone. It doesn't look very promising at the moment, and in 2021, the uh, United States and Russia are going to roll over the START, a uh, strategic uh, reduction uh, treaty, uh, although they can extend it per se for five years. But uh, neither side shows great enthusiasm for that. Then that means for the first time since 1972, we are not going to have any kind of nuclear regime between the United States uh, and uh, Russia. The CFE Treaty has been in abeyance for the best part of 20 years. Uh, open skies is more difficult. Uh, the Vienna, this place, Vienna document one or two, and conventional uh, transparency measures and arms control uh, is there, but... Uh, barely. Um, we have not got any ABM treaty uh, now, uh, any uh, longer. Uh, we haven't implemented the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, uh, even though it's been in existence for 30 years. Uh, Chemical Weapons Convention has been breached by ASAID and on a number of occasions. You look at cyber, you know, there is no uh, verification protocol for the Biological and Toxin Weapon Convention. On I go. Uh, in other words, we relied for our security uh, very successfully for 30 years on, you know, on military strength and deterrence, but even more importantly, on a sense of international law, of restraint, on codification, transparency, and so on. That has gone. Now, you could argue it's a good thing uh, in the sense that it was maybe overtaken by events. China, for example, with all of its intermediate nuclear weapons was not included. Um, okay, but uh, the, it's better to get rid of something when you've got something better to replace it, right? Um, and we have not been very active uh, in the West, in NATO, uh, coming up with new ideas, space being the latest, uh, how we regulate uh, these uh, various domains. Well, what does that mean, very briefly, then for the future of, of strategy? Uh, well, these things, of course, are not very pleasant, but... I suggest that we need to start thinking about them. I'm not going to have the answers today because the great thing about strategy is you sort of give the exam question and then get the brilliant minds to go away and brainstorm on the answers. But, okay, the first thing is what if we have to fight a big war again? Could we do it? Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you all saw D-Day, right? Um, and uh, I'm a academic historian by background and of course I was obsessed with D-Day I, I sat in front of the TV all night you know watching all the documentaries and so on and a couple of things struck me number one you know the immensity of the operation 150,000 troops just to get across the channel over 2,000 ships you know massive build up of supplies with the idea of getting 1 million 1 million allied soldiers across the channel in the first three weeks. Um, you had a massive deception campaign in Scotland, in, in, in Kent, you remember, to fool, sorry for the Germans here, but to fool the Germans, thinking that the attack would come across the English Channel. Uh, uh, you know, it was a close-run thing. It could have been defeated by the weather, but could we do that today, honestly? Something on that kind of, of scale with that kind of planning, that kind of massive coordination? Uh, uh, against an adversary, it has to be said, who had lost four out of every five Wehrmacht soldiers on the Eastern Front. I mean, if we hadn't had uh, the Eastern Front facing a much diminished Wehrmacht, which stood put up incredible resistance, at least at the beginning, we could not have done it. And I think, yeah, could we do that? Well, next thing that's interesting uh, about uh, D-Day is that a war is a campaign. I mean, for most of our my life, a war has been a kind of 78-day air campaign, right? Or a salvo of cruise missiles, or an individual cyber attack, you know, like the United States attacked the command and control of Iran by cyber means last week, you know, a quick thing, and that's it, a Stuxnet. But a war is a campaign that goes on for years that requires the immobilization of your economy, society. And so the first lesson is the ability to deploy mass 
consistently for a long period of time. Um, for example, uh, during the, the D-Day documentary, they had uh, the son uh, of the commander of the Sussex Yeomanry uh, 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 Division who, who, who had the job of defending against a regiment of German Tiger tanks on a hill just above Caen in France, you know, which uh, we destroyed <laughs> in order to save. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he was up against uh, about, you know, 20, 25 Tiger tanks, uh, and eventually they managed to prevail. But he told me in that time, uh, the son, so in that time my father was lucky because he was able to uh, bring up 1,400 Sherman tanks. In other words, you know, although the Germans were... Uh, knocking out more Allied tanks than we were knocking out cyber tanks. The Germans didn't have any fuel, couldn't replace their tanks, whereas the Allies had this massive ability you know, to substitute numbers for quality, for mass, and, and gradually overcome the resistance. That's a lesson there about mobilization. Are we able to do that kind of thing? And for example, one of the things that NATO is looking at is uh, military infrastructure, you know, uh, supply lines, ports. They're all in the hands of the private sector these days. Uh, you know, uh, with little cyber security, uh, with little resilience, with little redundancy, you know, roads, bridges, all of these things that you need to move an army around. Uh, you know, the, the Bundesbahn doesn't have all of those tank transporters that we used to have. So, you know, can we do that? Um, the second element uh, which really struck me during D-Day was innovation. Uh, you know, that... Uh, there was a one tiny story, but it was very interesting. It was a, you know, you remember when the Allies came on the beaches, the Germans had put these sort of metal traps on the beaches, uh, obviously, um, which may have given, in fact, the soldiers some protection. But anyway, the next problem was that the Sherman tanks could not get through the hedges, you know, the bocage in Normandy, uh, and were frustrated. And so one bright American, a genius, said, aha, I've got a great idea. We're going to take these things on the beaches, these metal rods, we're going to sort of, you know, cut off the, the edges so they're sharp, put them on the front of the tank, and then the tanks will be able to drive through the hedges. Brilliant. Fantastic, innovative idea. Uh, like, for example, the Sherman tank could not fight a Tiger tank, so the British had this bright idea of putting their sort of 70-millimeter 70, 70 gun onto the Sherman tank, which then gave it more firepower. So innovation, the ability to adapt old technologies to new functions. It's not just about new tech. It's the ability to find more value of old tech through innovation and adaptation. Just a couple of stories, but you know, these are the things that we need to start thinking about. We haven't done it uh, in Europe since the Second World War, thank God. We rehearsed it during the Cold War, but never had to do it. A lot of those skills, the civil emergency planning, the civil preparedness, the mobilization, uh, have been lost. We don't have government's departments to do it. And I know it's an extreme scenario, and I'm not suggesting we should hit our public opinion with it, but we as strategists need to start thinking quietly about, well, what if, what if? Uh, we had to once again to run uh, a major campaign. Don't forget that on the first day of D-Day, more soldiers died than in Afghanistan since 9-11. Uh, and uh, after one week of D-Day, twice as many soldiers died after one week than all of the battle losses of Western soldiers uh, in Iraq, in, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, and elsewhere since 9-11. Just an order of uh, comparison. We're, we're not used to that, right? Uh, God forbid if we have to ever face it again, but we need to think about it. Second thing, very briefly, uh, because I do not want to be even longer than some of my predecessors. <laughs> uh, I, I was impatient with them, so come on. It's fair, right? You should get impatient with me. But I think we need to think about the impact of the new technologies. You know, they're, they're coming very fast. Uh, we're seeing them already. Um, and like all things, they have a good side. We can exploit them. And a bad side, they can be exploited uh, against uh, uh, us. And, and how are we going to adapt them to military structures? I spoke this morning about my fear of the digital divide. 
uh, uh, which is a clear one. If certain allies are comfortable about using these things, and the new US cyber policy gives much more latitude, for example, to the Pentagon to carry out cyber attacks uh, without seeking White House p permission, you know, to sort of take the law into your own hands, if you like, uh, there are consequences for this, particularly if others are following a much more cautious strategy. Uh, and so one of the big questions is, is, of course, what are the rules that are going to govern these new technologies? Are we going to delegate uh, uh, decisions on firing to machine learning uh, robots, for instance? Do we keep the human being in the loop? Where is the interface going to be uh, here uh, in the uh, future uh, as, as well? For example, if, if many of these technologies uh, like computer chips and supply chains are being sourced abroad, where do we have to have our own autonomous defense industrial base to ensure that we have security supply at home? And what are the risks of using other people's technology? The whole Huawei debate is just a shade of things to come. Next thing, deterrence below the Article 5 uh, level. What works? What works? If we uh, evict a number of Russian diplomats in return for a Russian attack uh, with chemical weapons in Salisbury, is that the right response? We may feel good about it, but does that make somebody like Putin change his uh, calculus? What gets his attention? What works? Do we really have a good toolbox of policy options that we then can... Again, avoiding escalation, but re replying, respond to these kind of hybrid warfare scenarios so we deter this kind of behavior uh, in the uh, future. How can we know this? We've got a good sense of military deterrence working because we've got a good historical record to back it up. Hybrid warfare is more, at least in the form it's taking, is, is more recent. So how can we gain a kind of caucus of experience uh, about what actually works and what is appropriate uh, there? Secondly, attribution. If this is going to be done more and more by proxies, how good does the attribution have to be before we feel that, okay, looks like a duck, walks like a duck, sounds like a duck, is a duck, we act. Not a very easy thing uh, to uh, do uh, uh, either. Um, and uh, what would be the link between hybrid warfare and a real war? Uh, that's, of course, the most worrying scenario, particularly if you think of what happened in Ukraine and Crimea in 2014. So how can we pick up the signs of hybrid warfare that could point to a possibility of real uh, uh, action uh, in the uh, future? Um, of course, the bad side of hybrid warfare is it happens every day. The good side of hybrid warfare is it happens every day. In other words, we are forced to deal with it, and in doing so, we are going inevitably over time to acquire a certain know-how through training, through exercises, through responses, through experience that should make us uh, more uh, resilient. But what does it mean for strategy? It means that the focus shifts from deterrence by retaliation, you hit me, I hit you, to deterrence by Denial, you can't hurt me. Uh, you know, I've got resilient infrastructure. I can bounce back. I've got a resilient society. But you can't have resilient countries, ladies and gentlemen, unless you have resilient citizens. And how do, you know, with citizens who, of course, have never looked at themselves as being under any personal uh, danger and have always believed that it's the responsibility of the state in return for their taxes to provide all of the protection. How do we then start engaging our citizens? So sorry, mate, no, uh, I can only protect you so far. Cyber attacks, terrorism, other things, <laughs> you're on your own. Or at least you've got to be able, as like first aid, to be the first responder yourself. And Dan sitting there is from a country that takes this kind of stuff seriously in Israel. You can't have resilient society if you don't have resilient citizens. Uh, and how do we start engaging our citizens on what the baseline should be on essential, you know, don't do stupid stuff, uh, resilience? Um, Again, that's something that came much more naturally to our grandfathers and grandmothers in the 1930s uh, than it has come to us today. Um, finally, delegation of uh, security, which comes directly on from what I've said. Uh, the state can't do it all by itself any longer. Uh, we are now in an age where everybody has to do security. A company has to look at, obviously, protecting its staff, uh, duty of care when they go abroad, uh, insurance, you know, exercises, preventing cyber attack. Uh, a city has to look at how it responds to uh, a terrorist uh, uh, attack as well. In NATO, we go to organizations like Bellingcat. You know Bellingcat, uh, which is uh, Elliot Higgins? 
one of my heroes, and we say, hey guys, uh, please tell us what are the real identities of the GRU operatives uh, who gave false names when they used uh, Novichuk in Salisbury. And Bellingcat, within a couple of weeks, you know, with open source algorithm, says, got them for you, the names. They did. Uh, so there are now these interesting alliances with these civilian networks who often have the tech, the savoir faire, uh, even the governments don't have, uh, to get to the basic truth. So it's all about building these new partnerships uh, and these new uh, alliances. But as we do, and this is my final point, uh, the military are now in a difficult period because in the past, you know, security was the military. If you looked at the yellow pages, you know, the telephone advertising directory, and you said security, it would say Bundeswehr, army, you know, they do it. So all of the money goes to them. Thank you very much, because they are the first, second, and third responder. But of course, no, not now, no. Uh, after 9-11, the UK, my country, greatly increased its uh, budget for the intelligence services, who had a field day. Uh, while dramatically <laughs> reducing its budget for uh, the army, for defence, with the result that we went down to below 80,000 off uh, the uh, navy. Uh, the police and border guards in certain countries may get more, or the navies, because they're dealing with migrants, may be preferred to the uh, uh, air force, uh, even the private sector as it takes on more roles in guaranteeing government security, particularly, for example, in the uh, cyber field. And so we've got difficult choices to make uh, about um, uh, resource allocation. Now let me finish, again, uh, by a, a story from World War II. Um, you know, one of the things that always sort of intrigued me, I could never sort it out in my mind, uh, was why did Germany beat France in 1940? And I thought, well, you know... I don't believe in notions of racial superiority, although Hitler would have done at the time, but no. Um, you know, the French had their tanks. Uh, they had their Maginot line. They had a big army. You know, they'd make their plans and, uh, and, and everything. They knew where the threat was coming from. And, you know, uh, the Germans still largely had a horse-bound army in 1940. It wasn't a panzer army, uniquely by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and then it gradually struck me that, you know, what the Germans did in the 1930s and the French didn't was the experimentation. You know, geniuses like Manstein, Gudurian, you know, they, they didn't spend their time sitting in barracks. Uh, they spent their time, you know, exercising with different formations, different command structures, different tactics, you know, uh, companies versus regiments, uh, tanks alone, tanks with other vehicles, uh, until they basically sort of optimised what they thought was the best synergy of the four key ingredients of strategy. People, quality of people, process, general organisation and doctrine, and tech of course, technology. Uh, and it wasn't always a question of spending the extra Reichsmarks on technology. Sometimes, you know, extra Reichsmarks were better invested in people. Other times, those Reichsmarks were better invested in overhauling process and organisation. And that's the one thing that we're going to have to get back to knowing how to do, to factoring in the people, process, tech, tech organisation uh, square, and finding out at any one time what sort of event investment will give us the best false multiplier uh, a, a effect as well. So um, the bad news is that it's a complicated world. As Mrs. Thatcher would have said, it's a funny old world. The good news is that there has never been a better time for strategists. This is the golden age of strategists. When I gave my farewell speech at NATO... Um, I said that, you know, I had a wonderful career, but I really wish I could start today. I really did. I really would like to start now, not in 1980. Because, to my mind, now, with the complexity of the problems that we're facing, uh, never has been there a better time for the application of human intellect uh, to the world's uh, problems. But the first basis of this has got to be uh, to remember the wisdom of Bismarck. I know Clausewitz has been quoted here today. Uh, rightly so, but Bismarck said people can't create or divert the stream of time. They can only travel on it and steer with more or less experience and skill in order to avoid shipwreck. Uh, but if uh, your strategy avoids shipwreck, 
you will have not wasted your time. Thank you very much. You are the boss. Thank you very much, sir, for your brilliant presentation. No chance getting away with that <laughs> without answering. Okay, all questions. right. No escape. Uh, thank you very much. Professor Schriftam, bitte. Thank you. It seems to me, is it working? Yep. Yeah. It seems to me that the major obstacle for strategic thinking is cultural on two different levels. First of all, when you have in Europe people who are not willing to fight for their country, I believe in, in Germany it's 18% people who are willing to fight for their country. The only ones in Europe who are really willing to fight are the Finns, okay, because they have a good memory of, of what the Russians did and what they could do about it even as a small state. And you're not willing to spend anything on defending yourself. And then the question if you have brilliant strategic thinking or not, it doesn't matter because you don't have a people who are willing to fight and you don't have a society who's willing to finance it. The other problem seems to me to be more serious because the only thing you can do is what looks good and doesn't matter. Let me give two examples. First of all, why do you go to Libya? I mean, what's the rationale of going to Libya? It doesn't matter what you want to save 3,000 people in Benghazi being slaughtered by Gaddafi because it looks good and, and you can say we are, we are humanitarians and therefore we go into Libya. And then you destroy Libya because what you get is even worse than Gaddafi. And why should you care if he kills 3,000 people if you're thinking about defending Europe from the real enemies. Something even worse, Daesh, uh, ISIS. What does it matter? What can Daesh do? Now, is it a good idea to fight Daesh? Yes, why not? But when you're fighting it, and here is where strategic thinking has a major profound fault. When you're fighting Daesh, you're strengthening Iran, you're strengthening Erdoganistan, because as far as I'm concerned, there's no Turkey. There's Ataturkistan and Erdoganistan and Erdoganistan is on the wrong side, and you're bringing Russia to the Middle East because you want to fight um, uh, ISIS, you don't have boots on the ground, you take uh, Iranian uh, militias, and Iraq is now occupied by Iran. So that's what you've, you, you've achieved. You've fought with an insignificant enemy that kills people, but it looks bad on television because they decapitate people, and you strengthen Iran, which is 100 times more dangerous but you want them to deal with something that looks good. You, the only people you can really work with in, in the uh, Middle East, except Israel, is the Kurds. What do you do? You betray them for Erdoganistan. And then you say, anybody who wants to fight against terrorism, please come to Syria, and Putin obliges. He comes to Syria. So what have you done? You've taken a strategy, the dumbest strategy you could possibly have, and the only reason you pursue this strategy is that you can get a consensus of people who want to look good and cannot think strategically because if they would say what they think, they would be considered illegitimate in their own societies. So the question if you have innovation of putting a Sherman with the things that will go through the hedges is very nice and I'm for it. And by the way, if we're at war, I'm sure we'll have this kind of innovation. Our obstacle to strategic thinking is cultural, particularly in Europe. But other than that, I have no problem. <laughs> okay. Um, obviously, I have to do my best to respond to that. Uh, yeah, uh, Dan, I, I, I don't uh, lack sympathy for what, what were you say. And again, uh, you know, as a NATO official, I always used to say, look, standing up here as a former NATO official, I'm not responsible for all of the sins of the West. <laughs> you know, I'm not 
uh, taking on, you know, like Atlas, the mountain of sins uh, and mistakes are on, on my shoulders, particularly as some of them, fortunately, were not done by, by, by NATO. Uh, the first thing to say, you know, going back to your people won't fight thing, yeah, I mean, democracies are rather pacifistic. It's in their nature. That's good because that's uh, one of the uh, results of, of, of democracy, a feeling of security. Not every democracy. It depends which neighbourhood I imagine you live in, it's true. Uh, and it's different for you, of course, in the Middle East. But still, uh, you know, that, that is the fact. Uh, they, the, you know, they don't live in a state of perpetual mobilisation and massive rallies and, 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 and so on and uh, uh, patriotic speeches every two minutes, which is a good thing. Uh, but uh, it, that doesn't mean to say they don't fight. I mean, democracies, once they do go to war, as we all know, uh, of uh, you know, World War II is a good sign of that, are prepared to do every nasty thing possible uh, to win, and the moral sort of barriers come off immediately uh, once the uh, fighting starts. So democracies are, are, are pacifistic in peace, but doesn't mean to say that they can't make a transition. Uh, and people also change. I mean, for example, in, the, in my country before World War II, you're absolutely right. You know, there was the Peace Pledge Union, uh, big demonstrations in favour of the League of Nations and so on. Uh, the Oxford Union in 1933 voting uh, that it would never support fighting for king and country. But six years later, that mood had changed. It had switched. And to some degree... Uh, what happened is that fortunately, you know, I know I'm not trying to be good to them, but fortunately British politicians have sort of made the decisions to start rearming, even with a pacifist population, knowing that the threat was coming. Uh, and so by the time the popular mood swung, you know, 1938, 1939, the UK at least had started with radar and spitfires and hurricanes uh, doing what was necessary. So to some degree, yes, it does depend on the responsibility of the elite to be able to take those kind of difficult decisions before the public mood has swung around. That's called leadership, right? Not followership, uh, uh, leadership. But so, uh, so I don't, you know give up on democracies. The only trouble is they tend to change their mind very late in the day, which from a military perspective, in terms of preparations, can be too late. And the interventions in Libya, Iraq, and so on, yeah, I mean, you could ask yourself, uh, very briefly, I can see we don't have much time, but, you know, if after 9-11, what if the United States had, you know, decided that this was a horrendous crime, but to treat it as a crime? You know, to indict bin Laden, to punish the Taliban, as Clinton had done, you know, Al-Qaeda with a few uh, cruise missiles, even bring them down. But then immediately say, right, that's it, you know, we're now going to deal with this through the courts. Or like you Israelis after the 1972 attack on the Munich Olympic Village, you know, dealing with all of these guys in your own time afterwards sort of thing. Would we be in a better position today in the world? That's true, we'd have Saddam Hussein, we'd have Gaddafi, that is true, and... Uh, presumably some kind of Taliban regime in Afghanistan, but in terms of overall stability, would we be in a better position? The one thing I would say is that wars are the source of many of the issues uh, and, because they don't end any longer. You know, Afghanistan longer than World War I or World War II. And in terms of the, you know, the terrorism, in terms of the migrant issues, they are generated essentially by endless conflict. So I agree with you. Uh, uh, we, it does bear thinking sometimes about whether you know, the, the response completely outweighs the original sin, and it's the response that becomes the problem rather than the original sin. The one thing, final comment I would say in favour of NATO, is that the two things that have gone wrong, if you like, Afghanistan and Libya, were things which were not started as NATO operations. They kicked off, you know, with the US, of course, you know, going to Afghanistan, refusing European help at the beginning, or the French and the British, you remember, going after Gaddafi for Benghazi, and then NATO got dragged in afterwards. Where NATO has started the operation as NATO, Bosnia, Kosovo in particular, and it's been run through NATO right from the very beginning. Arguably, it's been on a better policy and le legitimacy basis, and we've had better results. But I'm not suggesting that's an answer because your questions are, uh, are very big and very important, but at least a, uh, a, a quick response. Thank you very much, sir, for the uh, brilliant presentation. I'm convinced there would be a, a lot more of good questions and even better answers. But due to the time schedule, I, I must beg your pardon that we uh, will postpone question and answers to our, uh, our dinner that we will have together. And possibly, as you asked, what, what could be a rationale for Libya? I could think of one. 
which definitely is not intended. So it helps to open the floodgates for migrants from Africa to Europe. Oh, that's a good thing. Yeah. Probably yeah. not intended, not yeah. never. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we continue. We ask General Narratives. He will give us a speech on the importance, the role of the phenomenon strategy on the strategic of the phenomenon will on strategic decision making. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, looks reasonably true. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's always nice coming here listening to interesting presentations. And I also appreciate the possibility to give a, let's call it a Nordic view of how we look at security strategy and our problems. Because the Nordic dimension, to my mind, is becoming more and more important in, let's call it the conflict or whatever we call it, between Europe and Russia. This year's topic is will and strategy. And I think I will present it as a small case study where I make a short analysis of how will might influence the cooperation between small non-aligned countries, that means Sweden and Finland. And basically, this is a question of Finland and Sweden trying to influence Russian willingness to embark on different adventures in the Nordic area. Very often we put together will and, let's call it, uh, potential and make a synthesis out of that and we call it the threat. And when it comes to influence the potential, small countries cannot influence the potential of Russia. In the Cold War, the US, NATO could influence the potential by, let's say, not allowing exports of high technology, a bit similar to what happens with, between the US and China today. When it comes to or when it came to influencing Russian willingness, there was a deterrence from the nuclear level down to the tactical level. Sweden and Finland, we cannot influence the potential, really. We can try to influence Russia's will to do something nasty. And unfortunately, we cannot lean on NATO as a deterrence. We'll have to try to create the deterrence ourselves in one way or another. And now let's see if this thing works. It does. Before I continue to, uh, on trying to describe how we try to increase deterrence, I would, just like, I would just like to point out the distances involved in this area. When I flew down to, from Stockholm to Vienna yesterday, I read in the small brochure that Austrian Airlines has all its planes, and there they said that the distance between Stockholm and Vienna is 1,270 kilometers quite far between Stockholm and Vienna. Then consider that the distance from the southern tip of Sweden to the northern tip of Sweden is 1,600 kilometers. 
And that is a quite interesting figure because it also leads that there might be different Russian strategic interests involved in different parts of the Nordic region. A Russian idea or a Russian need to do something might have totally different motives when it comes to northern Scandinavia compared to southern Scandinavia. But what are we doing, the Finns and the Swedes? We have embarked on a very uh, far-going cooperation trying to increase, let's call it, the deterrence value of our two militaries. And just to mention some of the projects, we have formed a joint naval task force in the Baltic Sea. We are coordinating our air and sea surveillance. Our air forces exercise routinely together, every week, I would say. The Navy is exercised together. When we have larger land exercises, we, the Swedes, normally go to Finland to participate, and the Finns comes, come to us. And we also have staff officers in the headquarters in Helsinki and Stockholm from the other country on a regular basis. They are, are it's not a regular basis. They are permanently there. They are permanently stationed in our respective headquarters. But the most important thing, perhaps, is that we have started also to coordinate our operational planning. So if there would be an attack on both countries simultaneously, the Russians would have to count on meeting forces from both countries that are acting according to pre-planned pre, uh, pre contingencies. But there is one crucial factor that we can't do that very much about. Is there a will to conduct common operations in case of only one of the two countries being attacked. And this really creates an interesting equation that has to be looked on from at least three angles. How does Sweden assess Finland's willingness to go to war with Russia if only Sweden is attacked? How do the Finns assess Sweden's willingness to go to war with Russia if only Finland is attacked? And most importantly, how does Russia assess the willingness of Sweden and Finland to go to war on behalf of the other one? And these questions, or these assessments, it's not quite just a question of psychology. It is a question of hard strategic factors where geography plays an important role. And just to give, let's call it one over clear example. There you see some circles. The importance of the Murmansk region, I think it's, everyone knows it. The Russians have their main base for their strategic submarines up in this area. And also the assets that Russia has to influence or try to stop uh, movements across nor the northern Atlantic from the US to Europe, the assets that could do that are also based in the Murmansk or the Kola region. And the full circle shows the very approximate ranges 
of Russian air defense systems based there to protect these naval and air assets. The dotted circle shows the area that the Russians could cover if they were able to deploy the same systems on Finnish territory. And it very clearly shows that NATO's possibilities to do something about the assets in the Murmansk area would, uh, would become much, much more complicated than they are today. It would mean that they would have to fly through contest contested airspace for some three, four hundred kilometers extra. And this is an interesting option from a Russian point of view. In case they fear that there would be some kind of conflict with NATO or the US, then they could do this as a precaution. Or if they are planning as a next step to do something, let's say in the Baltic States or Central Europe, wherever, where it is important that NATO can ship and fly assets across the Atlantic. Unfortunately, Finland and Sweden, we are not members of NATO, as I said, so this would probably not trigger an automatic response from NATO. Then this creates, of course, the uncertainty. Would Sweden do something to help Finland in a situation like this? The first question then is, are we prepared to go to war to Russia, uh, against Russia, even if we are not? attacked ourselves? And secondly, do we have the resources to do it? In one way, you, you could look at it and say, okay, we could create a lot of trouble for the Russians in the Baltic Sea. Uh, for all practical purposes, all Russian shipping in the Baltic Sea would stop if we tried or we used that option. But on the other hand, we might have a chance to keep out of the war. Is Finnish Lapland worth a war with Russia? And a very similar scenario would occur if the Russians tried to borrow Gotland. There you see the same idea with the circles and the air defense systems and anti-ship systems based in Kaliningrad, that's the full circle, <clears throat> and if the same systems were based on Gotland, that would make it extremely difficult for NATO to help their Baltic allies in case that was the next step for some kind of Russian operation. Gotland first, or parts of the mainland even, and then some kind of operation against NATO, that means the Baltic states. And that scenario could very well be a different scenario compared with the northern one. They don't have to take place simultaneously. And in this southern case, the Gotland case, it means that only Sweden would be attacked initially not Finland. And then would Finland go to war on behalf of Sweden to help us to defend Gotland? The problem in that case is that one can always wonder how eager the Finns are to go to war against Russia, and secondly, with what? The Finns can't do it, really. There's not much they can do to help us in this case. So, and this creates a quite interesting triangle of assessing the wills in three different or in three capitals. 
In Stockholm and Helsinki, we have to assess the will of our partner to go to war on our behalf. And that, and I, I already showed the scenarios. We have to think in both cases, both Helsinki and Stockholm, what is the reward really of taking the potential risk of committing ourselves to help a partner if you are not attacked yourself. But there is, of course, one big reward. If the Russians are convinced that Sweden and Finland, regardless of what, will help each other, that might raise the threshold so much so the Russians don't use any of these options. So where it, it becomes a three-dimensional, really, assessment. What do we think in Stockholm? What do people think in Helsinki? What we think, do we think about each other? And what does Moscow think that we think? It's a question of, as I said already, assessing the willingness of, in Moscow, of what are the Finns prepared to do, what are the Swedes prepared to do, and in our case, does this in any way, what we are doing between Stockholm and Helsinki, will that influence Russian willingness to do something? If I would try <coughs> to make, let's call it, the Russian assessment, then, of course, it contains several factors. But if I start with Russia looking at Finland, what would they see and what might they think? To begin with, how would Russia assess Finland's willingness to defend itself? Jamie mentioned that the Finns are one of the few people in Europe who are prepared to defend themselves. Yes, the opinion polls from last year says that 66% of the Finns are prepared to defend their country, uh, even if the outcome is very unsure. They don't know how it will end. But 66% of the Finns are prepared to defend their country. And the next thing is, do the Finns have the possibility or the potential to defend themselves? Yes, I would say that, that Finland is the country in Europe that is best prepared of all countries in Europe to wage a war. The Finns never abolished their civil defense structure from the Cold War. They never abolished conscription. They more or less kept every piece of equipment. So the Finnish armed forces today, or the start with the army, contains or consists of approximately 280,000 men, reasonably well equipped, to some extent very well equipped, well trained, and uh, depending on how you count, uh, I would say they have at least 10, 11 brigades that are very qualified. And then a part of that uh, large, a large number of local defense units. They have a reasonably good air force and they have a good navy for the Finnish archipelago. So Finland would not be a pushover for Russia if they tried. And in the Finnish case, I think also historical experiences might t uh, be an important part of the Russian assessment. The, Russian, the Finns have given the Russians a bloody nose, a really bloody nose, 
twice in modern times, 1939 and 1944. In both cases, they repelled uh, overwhelmingly big Russian forces to invade or they stopped overwhelmingly big Russian forces. And when you assess the Finns, that of course makes the Finns, uh, that would probably be something that heightens or increases the motivation for the Finnish forces to, to fight. We have done it before, we'll try again. And the Russians will of course remember, oh, it didn't work out well last time. It might be equally difficult this time. So I think the Russians might be a bit cautious when it comes to engaging Finland. We have to remember one thing, that Russia of today is not the Soviet Union of yesterday. The Soviet Union had 290 million inhabitants, a much broader industrial base than they have today. Today there are 140 million, that's half. They don't have Ukraine, they don't have the Baltic states. It's not that enormous bear that we saw during the Cold War. It is a dangerous bear, but it's not that big. <clears throat> When the Russians, uh, when they continue their assessment of Finland, then they of course would also look at the question, uh, would Finland be prepared to support Sweden even if Finland is not attacked? That means evaluating the Finnish potential to do something if the Russians do something in Finland. And then, of course, in the same equation, would Sweden be prepared to support the Finns? And in that case, with what? And uh, re considering the very limited military potential of Sweden today, the conclusion would be that the Swedes can't do very much or almost nothing in Finland. When looking at Sweden, there are, from a Russian point of view, the Russians would see quite a lot of similarities. To begin with, and that's a quite interesting figure, Jamie, uh, take a note, the Swedish population according to last year's polls, 71% are prepared to fight for king and country. But uh, the problem here is that when looking at Sweden from Moscow, the Russians would probably, or they have already observed it, the discrepancy between the will and the possibilities. And uh, one can wonder really if there was some kind of attack on Sweden, let's say the Russians tried to borrow Gotland or something, would the will to fight continue to be that high when it became obvious to the population that the resources to do something are lacking. That will, when you start to get the losses, you see that you can't defend more than just one small corner of the country, then that, of course, might affect the will to continue to fight also, unfortunately. So, my guess is, as a general staff officer in Moscow, is that considering the will of Helsinki and Stockholm to fight, the will in, respect, uh, in Helsinki and Stockholm to support each other based on potential, uh, 
is that Russians would come to the conclusion that Finland, to do something up north in Finland, although it has, there are very many rational reasons to do it in case you prepare for a conflict with NATO or afraid that NATO might attack you or the US might attack you, I think that the Russians would be a bit cautious when it comes to engaging Finland. Unfortunately, I don't come to the same conclusion when it comes to Russian operations in the Baltic that might involve Sweden. And if I may, as everyone else, mention Clausewitz, I think that I have made the case that uh, the importance of will and influencing the will of your uh, opponent is equally important on the strategic level as on the operational or tactical level that Clausewitz so very well pointed out. And with that, I will have at least some 15 minutes for questions, answers, and discussions. Ah, oh, and that circle, that is the analysis or the always ongoing analysis of the will in the three capitals that are concerned in my small case study. Thank you. General, I would like to ask you, why do you think that the Russians will attack Finland and Sweden? Only one for uh, a question. I oh, know, yes. When it comes to southern Sweden, as I tried to show with the map, an attack on southern Sweden is closely connected with the question if the Russians are interested of doing anything in the Baltic states. I, it's hard to envisage an isolated attack with only the goal or the aim to take a part of Sweden and that is. So if the Russians contemplate or consider doing something in the Baltic states that might uh, lead to some kind of reaction from NATO, military reaction, then it would be an extremely clever move, to my mind, to borrow parts of Sweden to stop NATO reaching the Baltic states, especially in time. So that is the connection with the Russian attack on southern Sweden. When it comes to uh, the northern part of the Scandinavian peninsula, then it is, I would say, there are, might be two reasons. The Russians might fear that NATO or the US, it doesn't have to be NATO, and that's the awful thing with this scenario that there, there might occur uh, situations where something in another part of the world, not in Europe, makes the Russians a bit scared that the, uh, the US might do something, not NATO, and thereby, and then the Russians think, okay, let's think of a cheap way to enhance the protective zone around Murmansk. When it comes to the other option, Russians are preparing a war against NATO. I don't believe that, but if they might do it, there is a Donald Trump number three in the White House, and the Russians come to the conclusion that the US will not engage itself defending Europe or whatever. It's hard to foresee the future. Then it becomes very rational to move the air defense zone 
around Murmansk or the Kola Peninsula, not just in the Finnish territory, but also in the Swedish territory, or even as far as Norway. And that means that northern Scandinavia is, let's call it, a vital, a vital piece of territory or geography connected with a conflict between Russia and mainly NATO. So, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a believer of the idea that Russia would uh, like to borrow, no, take Gotland and make it to, into Oblast Gotland or something like that. No, not that. Uh, the old offensive spirit, Karl Lauchi was faster than me to say a very big thank you for the presentation. Uh, that was geostrategy, strategy at its finest, as we are used to when you're uh, presenting, sir. May I ask you for one more? General, please. Yeah, good um, sir, let me ask you a, maybe a, a little bit challenging question. Sweden and Finland are both par, uh, members of the European Union. How do you assess the strategic role of the European Union in this area? We have a common security and defense policy. We have a common foreign and security policy in the EU. And wouldn't it be, um, let's say, a good approach to look at the, the role, the strategic role of the EU much more in this region? And uh, especially looking at the strategic factors. We have the Arctic Circle. We have the, uh, the fight about the resources in the Arctic Circle. We might see, let's say, the Northeast Passage uh, being usable uh, as climate change uh, comes along. And of course, uh, looking at the European Union once more, we also have the, uh, the Baltic states, we have Poland, uh, so the, the partnership, the close relation between those states might be of strategic importance as well. I hope that I don't misunderstood your question, but essentially you are asking what role does the European Union play when it comes to the security of the Nordic region? Was that correct? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, uh, the simple answer is very little. But then we are speaking about hard security. The European Union has in our thinking, very little to contribute with when it comes to hard security. That means planes, boats, uh, ships, uh, army divisions or whatever. In the framework of the European Union, NATO might, out of self-interest, engage itself in the defense of Sweden and Finland. But that is out of self-interest to be able to protect its Baltic members. But the European Union, uh, what comes out of PESCO or whatever it might be, 20 years, 30 years, if we are lucky. Uh, but <laughs> that's the dilemma of small non-aligned countries. We are not members of NATO. Uh, we are, but we hope that we, NATO will help us in one way or another, or that we will be able to fight together at least. Uh, the European Union has not much to offer. Uh, I just told you about the problems we have between Sweden and Finland. It's not problems. We, we are doing our best to deter Russia uh, with our common uh, cooperation concept. But uh, I think you should look at Sweden and Finland, both the, Nord uh, the Nordics, as we are betting on all horses at the same time, hoping that one of them might win if something not nasty happens. We are betting on NATO, we are betting on EU, we are betting on each other. So, but I'm sorry. Uh, 
the EU is not the favorite in this case. You talk about NATO's self-interest, but wouldn't almost certainly NATO see this as a need for an Article 5 preemptive action for, with relation to the Baltic Republics and Norway? Preemptive by whom? By NATO, to prevent this going any further, because there must be objectives on the Moscow side with relation to the Baltic mm. Republics, Norway, the Arctic Circle, etc. Mm. This is live streamed, isn't it? Yep. Ah. <laughs> uh, but uh, from a Swedish point of view, if there was a crisis where we started to see something dangerous at the horizon, this danger being Russia. Let's say we have clear indications that the Russians are preparing something in the Baltic region. Uh, we would welcome, I think, uh, let's not call it a preemptive action, but uh, some kind of uh, offer or request that says, could we help you? So is that an answer? Uh, when it, uh, you know NATO much better than I do. Uh, if it comes to start a preemptive pre war, more or less, or, uh, I think the decision-making process in NATO uh, would complicate that option quite a lot without the assent of uh, Sweden or uh, something. So, but a, a polite uh, question would be welcome. Thank you much, sir. Uh, I can suggest to you, if you want to know more about it, what General said and about the backgrounds, we have a very excellent article of General Nerdnix in the last conference proceedings where you elaborated on, on backgrounds of Russian mm. intentions. So if you are interested, I could suggest, advise, recommend to read this article of, article of General Meritnix. Uh, and I will uh, let you off into, into the break. You will grant us a 15 minutes break. Uh, after that, of course, I think everyone in the room is very convinced that there is no probability that Russia would want to seize Scotland or something else or Baltics. I think uh, there will be no, not, not much contradiction. But a big but in capital letters. What happened? Due to the st to staging forces as close to the western border that they can, according to the, uh, the example of the Rand Corporation study, they could in slowest move reach the line called uh, Tallinn Riga in, within 72 hours. A potential option, no, no intention behind it. They shaped reality. What happened? NATO, at least verbally, agreed on 2% two, two GDP. They reached to, to, to burden the coherence between NATO partners. They uh, led to a diverging threat perception between northern flank and central area. They made the Germans to establish a very high readiness joint task force. They made American tanks be stationed in Poland. They made preparations for American soldiers being flown over to take over their tanks. All that thing happens, although there is absolutely no probability. I will let you off with this as, as a food for thought. I have no answer either. I think China probably has one, but not that is uh, allowed to be streamed on live stream. So I wish us a good break, a big hand for John Narodniks, and we meet again at 70.55, if I may ask you. Thank you very much. <laughs>